Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. Researchers at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst have just released a new edition of the Greenhouse 100 Index. It ranks U.S. industries based on the quantity of greenhouse gases they emit into the atmosphere. Their work is largely based on 2014 data from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program. And Perry researchers have also done an analysis of emissions for each company's individual facilities and calculated the percentages of low-income and minority populations living within 10 miles of said facility. To help us break down the numbers and discuss what's changed and what has remained the same from, from the previous index, we have one of the authors of the Greenhouse 100 Index, Michael Ash. He is the chair of the Economics Department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he joins us now from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jessica. So, Michael, let's take a look at the index. Right away, we see topping the list are three electrical power companies, Duke Energy, American Electric Power, and Southern Company. Can you just break down for us um, what the source of these emissions are, and uh, where are they primarily geographically in the country? So that's a great question, thanks. So uh, those three companies are electrical energy producers. So they burn fossil fuels, in many cases coal, to produce electricity that homes and businesses uh, use. Uh, their holdings are spread out all over. Um, they have uh, high representation in the, in the Midwest, but um, they are also uh, you know, widespread. So there may well be a facility owned by Duke or American Electric Power or Southern Corporation right, right near you, right, right near you or, or, your, or your viewers. Um, as I said, they burn uh, fossil fuel that produces electrical, uh, electric energy that, uh, that, all, that all of us use all of the time. Uh, it's quite remarkable. These three companies alone produce 5% uh, of the, green, the total greenhouse gas emissions in the US. And that means not just greenhouse gas emissions from uh, electrical power production, but from all sources, including, um, including automobiles and uh, you know, uh, priv uh, various you know, private home, home heating and things like that. Okay. So it's a remarkable concentration at the top. How do you know all of this? Can you just tell us a little bit about your process, how you came to your findings? What was your method, essentially? Sure, Th thanks for asking. So uh, in, uh, since 2010, the Environmental Protection Agency has gathered information from uh, a large number of facilities, uh, uh, basically a full count of facilities that produce greenhouse gases. The uh, facilities themselves are required to report, so the data are mandated but self-reported from uh, facilities that produce greenhouse gases. And again, that, the list is dominated by electrical power generation, but industrial facilities, uh, steel makers, automakers, um, chemical producers also appear on the list. So the companies report these data to US EPA, and they report them on a facility by facility basis. So they might say, well, we have a particular coal burning power plant outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, and this is the amount of, electric this is the amount of greenhouse gases that produces. Um, at Perry, we take these data straight from EPA as published, and um, we just add them up by company. So it sounds like a very small amount of um, value added. The data are coming straight from EPA, by connecting the facilities to the companies that own them, we give a, a lever or a basis for activists, for socially responsible investors, for environmentally focused managers to assess uh, corporate performance in the area of greenhouse gases. Because it's really at the company level that the decisions are made that, uh, that, that produce these, these uh, greenhouse gases which cause climate change. And you also looked at individual facilities owned by these top 100 polluters and calculated the percentages of low income and minority populations living within 10 miles of each facility. What did you find and was there a consistent pattern nationally? So that's a great question. Um, so first of all, I, might, I want to speak to your viewers and say, well, you might think this is it's strange to take a look at the local at the, at the local populations around the facilities because greenhouse gases are really a global problem. At some level, it doesn't really matter where a metric ton of carbon dioxide is released. It's going to have the same effect on the, um, on the uh, heat-retaining uh, capacity of the atmosphere, the same contribution to, uh, to global warming. So the reason that we look at, um, at uh, 
populations, and particularly we look at vulnerable populations around facilities, is because when we move towards reducing greenhouse gases, as we must if, if we're going to survive as a species, uh, those reductions are going to happen in particular places where they are often accompanied by reductions in other toxic pollutants. So we can think of um, carbon dioxide as going along with a set of other local toxics that produce uh, a variety of health ailments from, from cancer to asthma um, to, uh, to, to aggravating, aggravating heart conditions. So we're interested in the, uh, it, we're interested in who lives near these facilities, not only because there are greenhouse gases, but be also because there are other pollutants being released at the same time. So taking a look at the list as a whole, we find, perhaps not surprisingly, that people of color and people living at or below the federal poverty line are disproportionately, live disproportionately close to, uh, to, to, the facility, to these facilities that produce greenhouse gases, and I need to underline other pollutants. Uh, that's something that we see quite systematically. It's not true in every case. Um, but it is, but it is a it is a, a a solid pattern of environmental injustice. And and certainly, the, would you say the majority of these facilities are in low income minority communities? Uh, I believe the majority of these facilities are in areas that are disproportionately, that's to say, above national averages in the representation of uh, minorities or low income people. In, uh, in the surrounding population. Okay, Michael, let's pause the conversation here. In part two, let's tackle why we didn't see some of these fossil fuel giants like Shell, ExxonMobil, why they weren't at the top of this greenhouse gas um, index. So let's pause the conversation. Thank you so much for being with us. Certainly, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Jessica. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.